Hey guys, today we're going to be going through some ionic compounds notes. Um, some of this you may already know from working with the ionic puzzle yesterday, but I found some confusion for some people. So I'm going to go ahead and do the notes. These are a little bit modified from what we did in class, um, but they cover about the same things. So a few days ago, we learned about types of compounds, and one of those types of compounds is an ionic compound. Ionic compounds are formed with cations, cations are positive, and anions, which are negatives. There are a couple of, of exceptions here. Um, if the cation is hydrogen, that makes an acid, and if the anion is hydroxide, that makes a base. But any other combinations of cations and anions are ionic compounds. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to make ionic compounds because there's a lot of different cations and a lot of different anions. But the general rule for what's happening is that cations are donating electrons to anions. The cations have extra electrons that they're trying to get rid of, and anions are trying to find more electrons to fulfill the octet rule that we learned about last unit. So these uh, cations and anions are going to go around swapping electrons until they are satisfied with either zero valence electrons or eight valence electrons, one of the two. The cations are trying to get down to zero electrons, or sorry, zero valence electrons, and anions are trying to get up to eight. When the atoms transfer these electrons, it forms an ionic bond that holds those two atoms together. We're going to look at magnesium and chlorine here as an example. Magnesium has two valence electrons, which you can find at the top of its group in the periodic table. It's got a charge of plus two. And chlorine has seven valence electrons. We looked at this example in our last video, but it's important here as well. And chlorine's charge is negative one. So when these two um, elements get together, magnesium is going to donate its electrons to chlorine. So magnesium is going to take this electron, put it here in chlorine's empty space. So this chlorine is all happy, it's all good. I'm going to highlight it green to say it's all good. But magnesium over here still has an extra electron, this bottom one right there. That one is still unclaimed. So what has to happen is another chlorine atom is going to come along, and it's going to be missing one as well. It's going to have an empty space. So magnesium's second electron is going to go over there and fill its empty space. So now this chlorine atom is happy, that chlorine atom is still happy, and magnesium has gotten rid of both of its electrons, so it's happy. This compound is completely balanced. But something we did not look at last time is the ionic charge of each of these and the total charge of the compound as a whole. Magnesium has a charge of plus two, and chlorine has a charge of negative one. But here we used two chlorines in the compound. So there's two negative ones in the total charge of this compound. If you add positive two and negative one and negative one, you get zero. And this is a super important result. And it turns out that the total charge of any ionic compound is zero. And we're going to use this rule to predict how many atoms of each element are going to be in a compound. Let's look down here at lithium and nitrogen as an example. Lithium has a charge of positive one. And nitrogen has a charge of negative three. You can pause and go look at the periodic table and see that this is true. So right now, this compound, if we just had one lithium with one nitrogen, the total charge is negative two, because positive one and negative three is negative two. So that's not balanced. It is not evened out to zero. The goal here is to even things out so that the total charge becomes zero. Right now, we've got more negative than we do positive. So to try to balance things out, I'm going to add some more positive. We've got two lithiums here with uh, positive one each. So that's positive two, which still is not quite balanced out to the negative three. So we add yet another lithium to make three lithiums that are all plus one. 
That equals a total of plus 3. Nitrogen, even just the 1, is negative 3, which is a total of 0. So this makes a compound of lithium 3, because we had to use 1, 2, 3 lithiums, and nitrogen, Li3N, because we just used the one nitrogen. And that is the ionic compound. Now I want you to pause and see if you can do these ones down here. Um, I'm going to walk through this first one. So if you need a little help figuring it out, um, I'll walk you through this one and then I'll um, stop it and write down the answers for all of the things. This first one's magnesium and bromine. Magnesium has a plus two charge and bromine has a negative one charge. So right now, the positives are winning. Magnesium has positive two, so it is overpowering the bromine, which means we need to add some more bromine to balance it out. The number of negative ones needed to balance a positive two is two. So we write MgBr with a little two because it was going to take two bromines to balance out that magnesium. Now pause the video, try to figure out the rest of these. I'm going to write down the answers so you can check yourself. All right, and there are the answers. You can check yourself. Um, one thing that I forgot to point out is that over here on number four, that was a typo. It's not O-L, it's just O. So sorry if that confused you. Um, but over there, it's aluminum and oxygen. So now that you've worked on balancing those things, I'm going to show you a little shortcut that you can use. So if you look at the charges on a compound, like let's look at number four, aluminum and oxygen. You write the charges at the top. Aluminum's a plus three and oxygen's a negative two. If the charges match, that means they're already balanced and you can just write the compound down on the line one and one and you're done. But if the charges are different, one thing you can do in if you don't want to take the time to balance all of it out, is called the crisscross method. And that's where you take these ionic charges and you cross them down to the other side, which would result here in Al having a subscript of 2 and O having a subscript of 3, which is the same answer as we got up there. So if the charges match, like with this one, magnesium is a plus 2, oxygen is a negative 2. Those are already balanced, so you just write it down. But if they're different, you can use this crisscross method to write the compound down. There is a little tiny exception that we haven't discussed yet, and that has to do with transition metals. Those are those metals found in the middle of the periodic table in the D block. Those metals don't have an ionic charge specific to them. They can have several different ionic charges. You could have um, cobalt that has a charge of two or cobalt that has a charge of three or iron with a charge of one. They can vary. So their um, ionic charge or their oxidation number is not on your periodic table. It has to be given to you. And the way that it is usually given is either by writing the charge up on top, like we normally write ions, or it could be with a Roman numeral after the name, like iron three for plus three. If you don't know your Roman numerals, here's a quick list of them. One I is the number one, two I's is the number two, three I's is the number three, and an I V is the number four. So if you see, um, a transition metal with one of these Roman numerals in parentheses, it is telling you the ionic charge of that transition metal. And anytime you write the name of a transition metal in an ionic compound, you're going to have to include this Roman numeral with it. So far, we've only been looking at metals and nonmetals in the compounds. However, Polyatomics are cations or anions, and they can be used in ionic compounds. And they act very similarly to metals and nonmetals. Um, they have a charge, and we're just going to use that charge to balance the same way we were before. Let's do an example with sodium and carbonate. Sodium has a charge of plus one. You can find that on your periodic table. But carbonate is a polyatomic ion found on your polyatomic ions list. It is CO 
3, and its charge at the top is negative 2. Now remember, this means the charge for the whole polyatomic ion, so you don't have to do anything weird like multiply or distribute. You just leave it exactly like it is and use negative 2 as the charge. So if you look at this compound right now with one sodium and one carbonate, things are unbalanced because you only have a charge of plus one and a charge of negative two. To balance things out, you need some more positive. So you would make this in a two, and if you did crisscross method, that would also work, in a two with one CO3. So that looks like in a two. CO3 for sodium and carbonate. Here's another example down here. This one's actually made of two polyatomic ions. First one is ammonium, NH4 positive, that's a positive one, and nitrite, which is NO3 negative two. Sorry, I lied, that's nitrate, nitrite is NO2, negative two. Gotta be careful with those endings there. So to balance out this compound, which is NH4 and NO2, you gotta look at the charges again. The charge on NH4 is positive one. Charge on NO2 is negative two. To balance that out, you're gonna have going to have to add more ammonia. Um, or you could just do the crisscross method like so. But the weird thing you have to do with polyatomic ions when you have a subscript is you have to put them in parentheses. So to say I need two NH4s, I have to put NH4 in parentheses, or parentheses and make it two. And tack on the end my 1NO2. So this would be ammonium nitrate. And its charges would be balanced because you'd have two positive ones and one negative two for a total of zero. Down here, there is a practice section. You can go ahead and try it, pause the video, do what you can, and then check your answers here in a second. And there's the answers, so you can check your work, see if you did everything right. Make sure you use parentheses correct, correctly on numbers one and four. All right, and last step that we have to do um, for today is we have to know how to write the names for the ionic compounds. To name ionic compounds, you have to first write the name of the cation, which could be a metal or it could be the polyatomic ion NH4. So let's do an example together with number one. I'll walk through these steps together. Number one starts with Mg. That's the cation and it is the metal magnesium. Step number one says we just write the name of it. So I'm going to write down the name magnesium. All right, step number two says, if it's a transition metal, write a Roman numeral. Magnesium is not a transition metal, so we skip number two. Number three says, to write the name of the anion according to the following rules. So we're going to look at our anion. Our anion here is CN. Part A says, if it is a non-metal, write the name but change the ending. CN is not a non-metal, but it is a polyatomic. So it says if it's a polyatomic, you just write the name unchanged. The name for the polyatomic CN is cyanide. So we'll write down cyanide for that one. The name of the compound there is magnesium cyanide. Cool beans. Let's look at number two. Number two starts with NH4, which is a polyatomic ion. Step one says write the name of the cation first. NH4 is the cation, its name is ammonium. Number two says if it's a transition metal, write a Roman numeral. Ammonium is not a transition metal, so we move on. Step three, write the name of the anion according to the following rules. If it is a non-metal, Chlorine is a nonmetal. Write the name, but change the ending to IDE. So chlorine, which normally ends in I-N-E, is going to become chlor 
I, you change that ending to IDE. So number two here is ammonium chloride. We'll keep going. Number three starts with aluminum. Aluminum is the cation. It is a metal. So you just write the name, aluminum. And the last part, SO3, is a cat, or it is not a cation, it is an anion, and it's a polyatomic. If the anion is a polyatomic, you just write the name unchanged. SO3 is, I think, sulfite. Yeah, it is sulfite. I had to go check my list. All right, next one down is, or starts with nickel. Nickel is the name of the cation. Write it down. Step number two, if it is a transition metal, and nickel is a transition metal, we have to write a Roman numeral for its charge. So we're going to put a little bracket there, or a parenthesis, and inside we're going to put the charge for nickel. To find the charge for nickel, we've got to look at the compound. The compound is NiClO3. We're going to look at these two parts separately. ClO3 is chlorate. And the charge of chlorate is, let me look at my list real quick, it is a negative one. The charge of chlorate is negative one. To balance out the negative one, nickel has to be a plus one. So we put a one inside the parentheses for nickel. Nickel is a plus one. This is not always true. It depends on the compound. Nickel could be any number of different charges. And to end that, we have ClO3, which is a polyatomic. It is the polyatomic chlorate. So I'll write the name for chlorate. Last one down here at the bottom is GaPO4. Ga is gallium, the metal. We just write the name down. Gallium is not a transition metal, so we can skip the Roman numerals. And PO4 is polyatomic, so we write the name of it. The name for PO4 is phosphate. You do also have to be able to take a name and change it to a formula. For example, here we've got ammonium fluoride. Ammonium is NH4 with a positive charge. And fluorine, which comes from fluoride is F um, with a charge of negative one. Those are already balanced, so the compound is NH4F. Go ahead and try the rest of these. Um, pause the video and check with my answers there at the end. All right, there's all your answers. Check to be sure you could get them correct. Now the last thing that you're gonna need to do today is finishing up or starting if you didn't start it the naming and writing ionic compounds worksheet that is in Google Classroom instructions should be there accompanying the worksheet. If you need more help, there is available in Google Classroom and on the website a thing called either the Compounds Interactive or maybe Compound Interactive Tutorial. Um, it's basically a guide to how to write the formula or name any compound. Um, so what you do is you go open it up, you start presenting the slides, and you click on the links for anything you want to do. Um, I'll see if I can pull it up here in the video. All right, here's a weird-looking overview of all of the slides that I'm talking about. So the first slide will say, what are you doing? And you'll click on whatever it is that you're trying to do. If you're trying to write a formula, you click on that. If you're trying to write a name, you click on that, and it'll take you somewhere else. So if I clicked writing a formula, pretend I clicked right there, it's going to take you over to a slide that says, cool, you're writing a formula, and it's going to ask you what kind of compound you're trying to write the formula for. We're doing ionic right now, so I would pick ionic. And then it would take you over to a slide for ionic, which tells you the exact instructions. It says write the symbol for the cation and anion next to each other, balance their ionic charges, to find the subscripts. If that's confusing and you need more help, there's a nice little example video explaining how to do all of these things. Um, so you can just play the video and learn how to do the thing. And if you need to do another compound after that, you click back to the beginning and it takes you all the way back to the opening slide where you start over. 
you can choose writing a name. So clicking writing a name, it's gonna take you to new slide that says you're naming a compound. And you choose the type of compound. If you're confused on what type of compound you're looking at, you can click here, it says, huh, I need help figuring this out. So you click on that and it's gonna take you close to the end. Let me see if I can zoom in there, where it says that you need help figuring out compound types. It explains how to do that in all of this text right here. Gives you instructions and it's got a handy dandy chart for identifying things. Like lately, we've been looking at metal and non-metal. That tells you it's ionic, tells you what the electrons do. And then you can click on these links for how to write the formula or how to write the name. And it's there for all the different types of compounds. If you don't know how to figure out if something is a metal, a non-metal, hydrogen, whatever, then there is another page, another slide over here that's got a chart to tell you um, all of the different options. Reds are metals here, and blues are non-metals, yellows are transition metals, and includes a weird couple of exceptions. Green is hydrogen. And then it's got a list of all the polyatomic atoms that you can need. So if you're stuck and you need help, this interactive tutorial is a super, super good resource for helping you figure out what you need to be doing. Um, so please use it. Please um, try it out before um, saying you're lost or saying you don't understand anything because this will hopefully help you a lot. Thanks for watching this video. If you have tried all of this and you're still lost, um, please email, please get help. Um, we're available during office hours, which no one normally comes to. So if, if you need to come to office hours, come to office hours. Um, I hope this was helpful to you and hopefully you can identify and name some ionic compounds.